Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. It is now my pleasure to present and explain to you today our work on protein interaction quantification with mass photometry. This work has been conducted at the University of Oxford in my joint PhD project in the Philip Kukura and um, Carol Robinson group. And today I would like to share with you, first of all, the results we were able to obtain, but also some important key insights and lessons learned. And more specifically, I will give you a short introduction into mass photometry and how we are able to uh, detect and quantify uh, single biomolecules and their molecular weight. And then in the research, uh, which is published in this this paper and uh, about which a talk today will be, um, we show then how we can actually go from counting these biomolecules to revealing first of all the purity, then the stoichiometry, binding affinity and the kinetics. And what we really show here is how we go from these uh, data, data here where you see uh, the relative abundance of bound and uh, unbound species to then uh, determine the constant in solution distribution and with that we are able to calculate this so-called KD which is an indication for the binding affinity or the, the strength of the interaction and we then also observe that we are actually able to follow formation or dissociation of these kind of complexes which gives access then to the kinetics which means the time components how fast is an interaction occurring which is uh, very important and to highlight again the importance of these, the importance of these informations. Uh, I give here a very prominent example. There are many examples, of course, but I, I just picked this one because it's a well-known one. Uh, the interaction or the attack of the HIV virus uh, to a host cell. This uh, primary interaction is based on uh, two proteins which are interacting, um, one on the virus and the other one on the host cell. And here it's, of course, you are interested in uh, what the stoichiometry is, so how many of each other are binding to, to each other, and also what's the strength and the time component. And this helps you to understand the mechanism, but also to understand what kind of, of uh, drug you have to design to be able to prevent or interrupt this interaction. So both strength and time component are, are really important. And on, the, on another level, uh, potential drugs for these interactions are monoclonal antibodies, which generated in, for example, 2017, uh, huge uh, annual sales. And you may all know that there are already uh, several other biophysical characterization techniques to actually determine the just aforementioned uh, parameters. So why is another one needed? Um, these existing techniques, they uh, struggle with uh, differentiating coexisting species. So do I have uh, one uh, drug bound to my, or one receptor bound to my antibody or two of them? Then they often require either uh, immobilization or labeling, which can of course uh, alter the interaction. Then in general, it is really difficult to uh, quantify strong interactions, which means in the low nanomolar or below uh, range because you have either you have to go to very low concentrations or your uh, instrument has to have really high sensitivity to actually detect the small number of unbound species in the huge quantity of, of complex species. And with this, often along goes long acquisition times, which obviously occupy your instrument and high sample consumption. And this can either be very expensive or depending on your, uh, the amount of your protein expressed, even uh, impossible. And where we would like to help with mass photometry is by offering a label-free and immobilization-free approach, then our experiments generally consume very uh, low amounts of sample and data acquisition is relatively fast. So a typical one takes uh, about uh, 60 seconds. And now into a bit more to the details of the technique, how it actually works. So you can have your sample in a physiological buffer, like for example, PBS, uh, and prior to measurement, or for your measurement, you dilute it to picomolar to nanomolar concentration. And you then inject your sample onto a, a pre-cleaned, uh, commercially available microscope cover slip, 
and we then irradiate we then irradiate an uh, incident um, laser beam onto the glass water interface where most of the reflect is reflected and we are not interested in this part what we are really interested in is the scattered light uh, it comes from mostly the the glass the roughness of the glass surface which is our background but we are also able to distinguish and detect the, the really small amounts of scattered light from uh, single biomolecules and we show in a previous paper that these biomolecules bind to this uh, glass water interface here uh, non-specifically and irreversibly and once they are doing this we are then able to actually uh, make them visi visible and we see them as black dots landing on our video and um, impressively now this uh, darkness is actually uh, very useful so uh, the relation is just shown here the, the intensity the, the scattering intensity is actually proportional to the volume for the particle and this becomes then really interesting once you realize that um, the materials you're looking at uh, like for example proteins all have roughly the same density then uh, with quite high accuracy so then they actually become uh, proportional to the molecular weight. And just to give you an, an idea of, of how simple these kind of experiments are, I'll show you here a video where we see the sample injection, um, and then we can directly start uh, our measurement where we see the single proteins uh, landing on the glass water interface. And we already uh, characterized a lot of these in the, in the two previous paper. What we were now, first of all, really interested in is in a, in a benchmark experiment to see how accurately um, our counting actually represents the in-solution distribution. And for this purpose, we um, had an uh, IgG monomer uh, and an IgG dimer. First, we, we thought we are quite unlucky because the protein expression uh, yielded uh, so much um, uh, oligomers, especially uh, dimers, but in the end it actually turned out to be really beneficial for, for, for this paper, paper here because we were able to then uh, sec, uh, purify the purification in the end in the polishing step and were able there with, with the help of mass photometry to uh, pick the uh, purest IgG monomer fractions and the purest IgG dimer fractions. And this gave us then two pure stock solutions of monomer and dimer, which we could mix at different ratios. And prior to measurement, then we diluted them again down to picomolar uh, or nanomolar concentration. And you see the outcome of these experiments here. Uh, you see here the molecular weight, which means here the typical mass, 150 kilodalton is the IgG monomer, and then here at 300 the IgG dimer. And we have here different uh, mixed ratios of monomer and dimer. And you see visually already that there uh, is a strong correlation in terms of these, these uh, predefined mixtures. We see here at the beginning, high abundance of monomer, low abundance of dimer. And once we uh, measure the different mixtures, uh, here the mixture with very low monomer content and high dimer content, we are actually already able to see the, the huge difference here. We then also, I wanted to put this a bit more into a number uh, context, um, which we see here. This is the expected monomer dimer ratio from UV measurements. And our experimentally determined mass photometry um, obtained monomer dimer ratio. We see there's a strong linear correlation, also the relative errors are really small. And this made us then very confident that we are actually really able to measure um, these ratios uh, so accurately and that they are um, representative for the in-solution distribution of these, these molecules. And from then on, um, we went on then to quantify now binding affinities. And quantifying binding affinity means, in, in our case, we want to know how much free species we have and how much um, complex uh, species we have to then be able to calculate the KD value, which is, the binding affinity. So how do we perform these experiments? Uh, we have binding partner X and Y. Um, we mix them together, equilibrate at uh, our working concentration, and we then uh, try to observe whether they are binding or not. And I think 
this slide here is, is the most important slide of the entire presentation. And it really it shows the, 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 the real big strength of, of mass photometry. So how do we perform these experiments exactly? So in the first step, we do a purity check. We measure each compound separately and see what, what there's around. So after purification, we uh, see that the ITG actually is uh, purely monomeric, which is very good. And the FCR receptor is purely monomeric as well. And in the next step, we mix them together one to one. And in these experiments, you immediately uh, see, first of all, the binding stoichiometry you have, which is in this case here, uh, one to one. So we have one receptor binding to one antibody. And you already immediately get an estimate of your binding affinity. So is it micromolar? Is it uh, nanomolar? Or is it very likely to be picomolar or even below? You immediately get this, this information from a very short uh, measurement. And now more quantitatively, when we uh, determine that here, we see that we have here mostly complex and very little free species, which gives us a KD in the, in the lower picomolar range. Um, now, interestingly, in literature, it's reported that once you remove the sugars here, they are uh, glycans attached in the FC region of the antibodies. Once you, once you remove them enzymatically, this will actually affect the binding affinity uh, to, the FC, to the FC receptor because it is binding in this um, region here. And we then uh, tested these hypotheses with d glycosylated herceptin and mixed them together. And what we observed is that we have indeed a uh, way higher uh, fraction of uh, unbound antibody. And this is also shown in the, in the, in the uh, higher KD, which we observe here. So again, this slide shows you purity, stoichiometry, and a very quick estimate of your binding affinity. In the paper, which I've shown you before, um, we then went further to actually uh, look how we can confirm these kind of measurements. And Confirming these affinities turned out to be uh, really important if you not want to know uh, more accurate uh, values for your KD. Um, how to do this? Um, we do a, a dilution series, so measuring the same sample at different dilutions. And what we were able to see here is that at high concentration, you have mostly complex um, antibody. Once you dilute down, it starts to fall apart, uh, where um, here, for example, you have mostly um, unbound species, which is exactly what you uh, would expect. So again, here you can already visually recognize uh, this difference and you can then also confirm it in terms of numbers um, because obviously the KD should always be the same, independent at which concentration exactly you're measuring. And this is exactly what we show here. Um, we get at all the different dilutions, we get roughly the same uh, KD value. And this is very important. Um, we then uh, try to uh, benchmark further and see where, where the limit is. And for this, we picked uh, an interaction which is known to be really, uh, really tight and strong. And this is also probably why Herceptin, an antibody, uh, is one of the most uh, successful uh, cancer drugs. Um, it's just the interaction is extremely tight. And so we mixed Herceptin and uh, its target, uh, HAR2 receptor, together. and did again the dilution series. What we observed here, at independent of concentration, uh, our data looks always the same. And uh, when we quantify that a bit more, we see that actually we have uh, here the IgG concentration, here is the KD. We have a very strong linear dependence uh, of KD on concentration. And this should obviously not be the case. So this is a clear indication that the interaction is too tight. Uh, for us, so we would need to go to way lower uh, concentration. Therefore, uh, by knowing this limitation now, we define the maximum values, which is uh, the KD1 um, is uh, below or stronger than uh, 70 picomolar and here stronger than 240. So from this measurement, we know, first of all, the affinity, uh, the maximum affinity. Um, we also know or the minimum affinity actually. So the, how strong it actually uh, can be or how even stronger it can be. And the stoichiometry of the interaction as well. So one to one and one to two, this is very important to see. Um, 
Yeah, so these maximum values here. And the lessons learned from, from these experiments was that the single shot experiment is extremely amazing because it's so quick and fast and it's only an estimate. So you should ask further questions like, for example, how can you prove that you are in equilibrium? Um, do you have inactive uh, portions of your protein in the sample? Are you kinetically trapped or are you within the dynamic range of, of, uh, of our technique? And so KD experiments that are very accurate ones should be performed and this is known from, from every textbook uh, at concentrations around the KD. So if your KD is 10 nanomolar, you should perform your uh, KD um, titration or measurement around this range, a plus minus a factor 10. And this is also, also true, true for titrations. Um, and to visualize that a bit more, I simulated here an example. We also um, measured it. Um, and we didn't publish it, and I just think that the simulated one is a bit more obvious to, to explain. Um, so we have here uh, a simulated concentration uh, of Herceptin at 10 nanomolar and um, the R2 uh, titrated from 1 to 70 nanomolar. So here the first uh, simulation, which assumes a KD uh, 1 and KD 2 of 1 and 3 nanomolar. So this is the good range. Uh, that's a, an experiment you should conduct in this way. What you see here is that you can actually uh, see the binding uh, curve here and it uh, falls down uh, uh, acceptably uh, slow. You can, so you can follow it over a wide range of, of concentration. Um, the next two examples, you obviously see here, uh, once you have a tenfold stronger KD now, uh, you see that also in this shape, it falls down uh, much quicker. So you can immediately distinguish them. But what's now really difficult is actually to distinguish this one from uh, even 100 times even stronger interaction. So it is difficult to distinguish because you need to have very high sensitivity and precision in this range here. That makes it uh, difficult. So uh, preferably always perform this case, which means the KD experiment at the concentration around the KD. And from these lessons learned, and the previous experiments, we then also saw that next to determining the binding affinity and the stoichiometry and the purity, we are also able to actually uh, see the time components of, of these interactions. So this brought us then to the kinetic measurements. Uh, I show you here the dissociation experiment. So we let the complex and the, so the complex of IgG and FCR uh, receptor fall apart. And we follow that dissociation. In the paper, we also show the, the opposite example where we let them associate. Um, here you can extract the KD value from the plateau region, and you can also from the fit then uh, extract uh, the, the on and the off rates. We perform these experiments for the intact IgG and also for the deglycosylated one. What we saw again here is that the deglycosylation weakens the KD, and this uh, weakening mostly comes from the change in the off rate. So the deglycosylated antibody has actually 10 times a faster off rate. So it falls apart much quicker. And we were then interested in uh, comparing our results to surface plasmon resonance, uh, which is an established technique in this field. Um, and so that we actually have very comparable off rates, but that SPR has roughly 20 to 80 times fold slower on rates. So it seems to be more difficult here to form a complex and we uh, in SPR. So we attributed this to the difference in how these experiments are being performed. For our SPR experiment, we immobilize the antibody onto the dextrin surface, which is a general procedure. And of course, this immobilization will affect the, the binding affinity. And, and here in this case, mostly via the, the on rate because it's less accessible. In the mass photometry experiments, however, uh, molecules uh, can float freely in solution, are therefore always uh, freely accessible uh, to form complex. Um, so now we have stoichiometry, purity, um, binding affinity, and kinetics. And we then try to uh, push it even further where other techniques really would start to struggle. And here, a very complete, this is a a complicated system because it has different um, 
different species uh, around. Um, it would be very difficult to resolve with any other technique. So we have here the IgG and the FCRN receptor. So that's a different receptor now. And from literature, it is well known that this interaction is highly pH dependent. And it is disputed whether the FCRN binds as a monomer or a dimer. And what we observe here, for, uh, first of all, when you do the purity check, the FCRN is present as monomer and dimer. And already this interaction is highly pH dependent, uh, whereas the IgG is not affected by uh, pH. Um, we mix then these uh, two compounds together in a one to two ratio, so a little bit of excess of FCRN, and measured this at different pHs here, uh, pH five to six. Literature predicts that at uh, pH five, you have a, a strong interaction, which means in the nanomolar and once you uh, increase your pH to what six or seven, your interaction becomes weaker and weaker. And this is exactly what we uh, observed. So comp complexes are forming at low pH and all are negligible at high pH. In this experiment, we were able to resolve the coexistence of these different species here. And this helped us then to define a model. And with the data, we could then assign the, the according KD values to these different steps here. So resolving complex stoichiometries is, is a really powerful part of the mass photometry technique. And now to uh, recap what I showed you today, we are able to measure label-free, immobilization-free, and in solution, um, the molecular weight of, of biomolecules. And we can use these measurements to then actually uh, quantify purity stoichiometry of interactions and also binding affinities by knowing how much uh, bound and unbound species we have and by calculating then the, the KD here. And we can further push it to even uh, access uh, kinetic uh, rate constants. And further on, this can also be done with really complicated uh, systems where you have different uh, uh, coexisting species uh, present. And with that, I hope that um, these insights, sharing these insights is, is uh, helpful for you and your uh, future mass photometry uh, based or involved research. And I uh, thank you a lot for your attention and uh, please, free to, uh, please feel free to ask any questions and also uh, have a look at our uh, publication here or if you have any further questions, just contact me via email. And uh, I would like to thank um, <clears throat> my two professors philip kukura and carol robinson for allowing me to work on on, on their project and uh wes Sury for his continuous uh, support over the past almost three years then all the involved group members for their uh, commitment and uh, comments then the the barrow foundation lord Flory scholarship uh, for uh, financing my, my PhD here. I'm, I'm very grateful for, for that. And with that, I thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Greg Piszczek and I had the pleasure to talk to you today about applications of mass photometry. During this talk, I'll try to show you how we can use mass photometry to quantify protein-protein interactions with multiple binding sites. Uh, Fabian already gave us a great introduction to the mass photometry technique and to binding, uh, so my job here will be easier. And I will start off with an outline of my presentation. Before we talk about a mass photometry, I want to show some examples of how multivalent interactions uh, can be characterized uh, using the classical methods, ITC, MST, SPR, BLI, and AUC, uh, coupled with global analysis. And then I will show you how this can be simplified uh, when using mass photometry. I would like uh, to also give you some examples of different uh, ways mass photometry binding data can be analyzed to obtain binding affinity values. Uh, and finally, I will touch on the limitation of mass photometry in the context of uh, binding affinity measurements. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> but first, uh, let's answer two questions. Why are we so interested in binding affinities of multivalent protein-protein interactions? And why are those interactions important? Uh, here you see a map of uh, human interactum. Uh, this is actually a graph that is already 15 years old. And since then, this map uh, has only gotten more complicated. It is immediately obvious uh, that proteins are very social molecules. Um, the protein interaction network is very dense. Um, and with some exceptions, uh, for example, enzyme inhibitor interactions, a lot of uh, proteins are involved in interactions with multiple partners. Obviously, when we consider various cellular processes such as regulation, signaling cascades, uh, or um, uh, the formation of cellular structures, all those processes involve multiple protein components interacting together. Uh, from the point of view of uh, the experimentalist, however, those interactions are notoriously difficult to characterize. When we want to measure binding affinities of interactions uh, in uh, uh, multivalent complexes, one approach um, that is available to us uh, is to use the classical biophysical methods. In our core facility, we're fortunate that uh, we have access to all um, important methods that can be used to measure protein um, binding affinities. Here oh, we see um, raw data from the AUC, ITC, fluorescence, SPR, BLI, and the MST that we collected for one of those systems uh, that I will be talking about uh, in the next few slides. Uh, those are all excellent methods, uh, and they are very effective for the characterization of one-to-one -one interactions, but often the situation uh, becomes much more complicated uh, when two or more binding sites are involved. Uh, for example, to characterize the two-to-one -two interaction, uh, we will need to obtain the information about populations of multiple species that are formed in this process. Um, often, however, uh, the binding signal that we can obtain from those uh, methods represents the average uh, or the sum of signals coming from those different populations that are present in the reaction mixture. Uh, and the precise information uh, we are looking for is lost. Uh, I will first show you how we can solve this problem with global analysis, and then uh, how this information can be uh, easily obtained with mass photometry. Uh, let's first focus on a simple system of the alpha chymotrypsin and the soybean trypsin inhibitor binding. Uh, here we see the microscale thermophoresis data for this system. And in this method, uh, we fluorescent label one of the binding partners uh, so we can detect it at the very low concentrations. And uh, we measure the effect of the ligand binding uh, on the thermophoretic diffusion of those molecules. Uh, this way we can obtain the binding curve. And here we see the titration of the labeled comatrypsin with the inhibitor. Um, in uh, this uh, interaction, the STI inhibitor binding binds two chymotrypsin molecules, and the binding affinity of the weaker side is approximately 40 to 50 times lower than the affinity of the tighter side. Uh, as you can see in this data, there is no indication that there are two binding sites involved in this interaction, and the apparent affinity obtained um, from the feet is relatively strong. Uh, when we reverse the situation and fluorescent label the inhibitor and perform titration with the enzyme, the binding sites uh, would be populated differently. Uh, in the previous titration on the left, um, the concentration of chymotrypsin was very low, and this results in a preferential occupation of only the strong binding site on the STI. <clears throat> in the second titration on the right, the chymotrypsin is in excess uh, over the STI, and both inhibitor sites are being populated. Uh, and as a result, the, bi uh, the apparent binding constant obtained by fitting the second titration curve is much weaker. Uh, we still don't have any indication of the two to one stoichiometry we perform uh, just one of those experiments. When we analyze both data sets together uh, in a global analysis, uh, we can use the appropriate two-to-one binding model 
and obtain values uh, of both uh, binding affinities. Here uh, we see the results obtained for uh, the system by the isothermal titration calorimetry, and the situation uh, is quite similar. The ITC calorimeter directly detects the heat of the reaction associated with the complex formation, uh, so no protein modification is required for this method, uh, but we still obtain similarly different results depending on the direction of the titration. Uh, as, um, as we see, uh, one of the signal curves uh, is steeper, indicating the stronger binding, and the other on the left uh, is more shallow. Uh, the ITC gives us information about the stoichiometry, uh, and we can see on the plots that the midpoint indicates that the saturation occurs uh, at either 2 or 0.5 uh, molar molar ratio. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, so, so we can say from those plots that uh, the inhibitor to enzyme binding ratio is 2 to 1, uh, but in principle we still don't know how many molecules uh, form the final complex. Uh, the answer might be uh, 2 to 1, uh, 4 to 2, uh, etc. Uh, the precise composition of the final complex is often very important. And as we'll see in a moment, it is quite easy to obtain by um, mass photometry. Uh, uh, the feed shown here is a global feed uh, of both titrations. Uh, and again, this uh, allows us to obtain uh, both binding constants. Uh, in this case, however, despite the fact that uh, ITC is usually um, much more precise than MST, uh, there are additional parameters required in this feed, uh, namely enthalpy and heat of dilution for each titration, um, and the requirement to feed those additional parameters uh, increases the, the overall feeding error. Um, at the bottom, uh, we see the error intervals analysis for the two binding constants, which is, by the way, the method that uh, we use to obtain all the errors I, I, I um, report this presentation. Uh, for this feed, uh, one side of the high score curves uh, never reaches the critical one sigma value. Uh, so consequently, uh, those error intervals are open on one side, and we can only say that uh, one of those binding constants is stronger than, and the other uh, is uh, weaker uh, than a particular value. One way to circumvent this problem uh, is to combine different uh, complementary data sets. Uh, when we take all this data and feed them all together in a global analysis, uh, we can get precise information on both um, binding constant values. Uh, on this plot, uh, we see two MST titrations shown in green, uh, two ITC um, titrations in red, um, uh, the sedimentation velocity data uh, obtained by AUC uh, in the lower right corner and in the upper right corner uh, are data obtained by the biolayer interferometry. Uh, this particular BLI experiment was done in a competition mode to avoid um, any uh, possible effects of the protein immobilization. Um, the software that I used uh, for the global analysis uh, was created by Peter Schuch here at NIH, uh, and it's called CETVAT. Uh, this is a free software uh, that can be used to analyze data from many different techniques, uh, and it has a long list of binding models that can be used to, to feed those data. Um, the analytical chemistry paper, um, the reference shown on the bottom, uh, by Joy Zhao and uh, Peter Shook, uh, described the global analysis approach uh, implemented in CETFAT and also contains a much more detailed anal uh, analysis of this particular protein system with a lot of interesting conclusions. Uh, and I would like to refer everybody interested in learning more about uh, global analysis to this paper. Uh, this is a very elegant and powerful method uh, to study um, multivalent interactions, uh, but it is definitely uh, not simple. Now enter mass photometry. Here I'm showing you the data for the IgG antibody binding uh, human thrombin, 
And those are, I think, the first mass distributions that uh, we obtain uh, for the system when we're uh, just trying different things uh, on our new uh, mass photometry instrument. Uh, on the top panel, uh, we have the antibody alone at a concentration of about 25 nanomolar. Uh, as you can see, it is a nice clean preparation with mostly a single 150 kilodalton peak. Uh, we don't have the distribution for the thrombin alone, uh, since the molecular mass of thrombin is uh, about 37 kilodalton. And uh, this is below the detection limit of our instrument, uh, which is about 45, 50 kilodalton. Um, we wanted to see the complexes, uh, so we prepared two antigen um, antibody mixtures. Uh, since we expect two to one binding here, uh, we prepared samples with about two times molar excess and with about five times a molar excess of the antigen. Uh, uh, for the, um, the last sample, the total protein concentration is just above 100 nanomolar, so it is higher than we normally use for mass photometry. Uh, but in that case, the, the small molecular weight of the antigen is, is actually working to our advantage. Uh, and since we do not detect the three thrombin molecules, um, the higher antigen concentration contributes to a slightly higher background noise in the mass photometry images, uh, but we can still very easily process this data and get good resolution uh, of the, the mass distributions. Uh, what is um, instantly apparent when we look at those uh, uh, two mass distributions for, um, for the mixtures, uh, it is that uh, for the uh, sample in the middle, uh, the middle concentration, um, uh, the uh, superb uh, mass resolution of the mass photometer allows us to detect all the molecular species that we expected to be present in this sample. Uh, we can see three peaks, uh, the 150 kilodalton peak representing the free antibody, uh, the peak for the one-to-one -one complex in the middle, and the high molecular mass peak uh, for the two-to-one complex. Um, in the sample with the higher uh, antigen concentration, uh, shown in the bottom panel, um, the antibody is almost completely saturated and the distribution shifts into the high molecular mass peak. Uh, since the mass photometry directly counts the molecular landing events and those distributions are number distributions, we can easily uh, use this data to obtain the binding constants. Um, if we know the population of the free antibody, the one-to-one -one and the two-to-one complexes, uh, we can uh, directly calculate the values of both binding constants from the binding equations. And here we did just that. We obtained the population of each species uh, by fitting the mass distributions with Gaussian peaks. Uh, this is a series of distributions obtained, obtained from a titration. Uh, and we see that with the increasing concentration uh, of the antigen, uh, peaks representing the protein complexes are building up. After integrating the peaks, uh, we can plot the populations of those species uh, as a function of concentration and feed them using the two-to-one binding model. As you can see, the fit is quite good. Um, we see the decreasing population of the free antibody, uh, an increase in concentration of the two-to-one complex, and the one-to-one -one complex uh, that initially increases uh, to reach the maximum, and then decreases when the antibody is saturated uh, with the antigen. The main difficulty uh, of this type of analysis uh, is the Gaussian fitting of the distributions. Uh, we want to extract the concentration information about the population of all three species. And this is relatively um, easy when all three peaks are well defined, uh, like for the 16 nanomolar um, uh, antigen sample. But for the distribution dominated uh, by a single peak, the error intervals uh, of Gaussian fit increase dramatically. We can obtain much more robust fits when we introduce some constraints. Uh, for this, we have to fit uh, this data together, uh, uh, linking the Gaussian fits of different distributions directly using the two-to-one binding equation. In principle, each Gaussian peak uh, has three fitting parameters, 
and uh, we are fitting 15 peaks in this titration, so there is a lot of parameters to fit. Uh, we can, however, fix uh, the non-molecular masses of all components, and we can link the widths of those peaks uh, since they will not uh, change with the concentration. Uh, the global fit obtained uh, this way is uh, very good, and most importantly, uh, we were able to greatly reduce the confidence intervals of uh, the binding constants. Here I want to mention uh, that we can also obtain the information about the cooperativity uh, from this analysis. Um, the model that we are using here uh, and the equation that I have shown earlier represent the macroscopic uh, binding model. Uh, for the two independent and uh, microscopically identical binding sites, uh, as expected for the antibodies, the micro, uh, macroscopic affinity uh, for the first site should be four times higher than the affinity for the second site. Uh, here, the K1 is not four times higher, but only slightly larger than the K2, and this indicates uh, a weak positive cooperative ion binding um, that we see as an increase of the binding affinity uh, for the second ligand. Uh, this kind of positive cooperativity uh, for the antibody binding sites uh, was reported uh, before. Let's compare the global analysis uh, with the uh, analysis, uh, analysis of individual distributions uh, of this titration. Uh, here the results uh, for the global feed are represented graphically. The dashed uh, vertical lines are showing the fitted affinity values and the width of the rectangles represents the error uh, intervals of the feed. Uh, now we can compare the results obtained from the independent analysis uh, of each point of the titration. Uh, obviously, at the beginning of the titration, we have very little information about the population of the complexes. And for the last sample, there is almost no information about the free antibody uh, and the one-to-one -one complex population. Uh, so error intervals for those feeds are very large. Uh, but uh, when we are in the sweet spot of this titration, uh, and all three peaks are reasonably populated, uh, the results uh, and the errors uh, of the analysis of this single sample are almost the same uh, as those obtained from the global analysis uh, of the whole titration. Um, we wanted to confirm this data uh, with another method using unlabeled and unmodified proteins, uh, and we use the ITC uh, to validate the photometry results. There is another way to analyze the mass photometry distribution that is useful when we study interaction with ligands that have smaller molecular masses. Uh, in that case, uh, or in any case really when uh, the distribution peaks are not resolved, we would not be able to fit the species peaks with Gaussians and we would not be able to extract the species populations that way. Uh, in that case, we can simply calculate the average um, value of each distribution to obtain either the average contrast uh, or the average uh, mass for uh, each distribution for each titration point, uh, and then fit those points with the appropriate binding model. Uh, for the two binding sites um, system shown here, we uh, are obviously losing the information about the population of the individual binding sites, uh, but we can still easily feed the data and obtain the same binding constant that we would get from the SPR, MST, or other methods, uh, but much faster uh, without labeling or immobilization and uh, with less material. Uh, one more remark here, the fitting curve looks like it doesn't have enough curvature, um, but when we expand um, the concentration axis, uh, we'll see that the fit has two asymptotic values, uh, the molecular mass uh, or the contrast value of the antibody at the low uh, ligand concentration limit and the molecular mass of the complex at the high ligand concentration value. Uh, both of those values can be easily obtained uh, experimentally by uh, mass photometry. I promised to talk about the limitations uh, of the mass photometry, and I already mentioned one of them related to the minimum molecular weight 
uh, of the binding complex. Uh, the smaller molecular mass uh, that we can measure on our instrument is about 45 kilodalton. Uh, so ideally, at least one binding partner should have a uh, molecular mass above the detection, this detection limit. Uh, the smallest ligand that we tried to measure on the mass photometry was uh, the ubiquitin, which is uh, just below 9 kilodalton. Uh, in our hands, that is also a limit of the smallest molecular mass of the ligand uh, that we can measure. Uh, another limitation uh, is the range of the binding constant that we can measure with uh, mass photometry. Uh, since this is a single molecule technique, uh, we are working with uh, dilute solutions, and this usually limits us to the measurements of stronger binding. Uh, mass photometry is actually ideal for the characterization of uh, antigen-antibody interactions, uh, since both the affinity range and the molecular mass range is in a sweet spot uh, of this technique. Um, this is um, going to be, I think, a very important application of mass photometry, uh, since uh, antibodies are used in so many applications, uh, and we published a protocol in Jovi uh, describing this in more detail. Uh, this protocol should be out in a couple of weeks. Uh, on the side of the weaker binding, uh, the mass photometry limitation is related to the maximum concentration that we can use in our experiments. Here I have an example of this kind of a system. Um, this is CD16 binding. Uh, in this case, the IDG antibody is a ligand, uh, and this is a one-to-one -one binding system. Uh, this mass distribution was obtained for the mixture of 40 nanomolar of the CT16 and 40 nanomolar of the IgG antibody. As you can see, the complex population peak uh, on the right side of the antibody peak is relatively small, and we still see a lot of uncomplex antibody, uh, and this definitely signifies a weaker binding. Uh, we can try to increase the protein concentration to uh, populate more complexes, uh, but this results in a very high density of landing events that uh, start to overlap, and this affects the quality of the data. Uh, here uh, you see the mass distribution obtained for the total protein concentration of about 130 nanomolar. The distribution peaks are wider and we are losing resolution, uh, and this indicates the concentration is too high for um, uh, this mass photometry measurement. We can still easily calculate the binding constant from this um, first distribution, and we can obtain accurate results, which we validated here using BLI, uh, but this binding is definitely approaching a limit of what we can measure with mass photometry without applying any special methods. Uh, one way to measure higher protein concentration, uh, to be able to measure binding in a uh, micromolar range, uh, is to use passivated cover slips, uh, but this certainly complicates the measurements. Um, on the other hand, extending the measurement range to even stronger sub nanomolar interactions uh, is possible and is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, in principle, uh, this only requires longer acquisition times uh, on the mass photometer uh, to accumulate larger, large enough um, populations of molecules uh, in each measurement. Uh, and the best um, uh, way to achieve this is with a flow cell uh, to avoid concentration depletion uh, for those uh, extremely uh, diluted solutions. And with this, uh, I want to end, uh, hoping that uh, I convince you that the mass photometer is an excellent method to measure strong protein binding and a great way to study uh, multivalent protein complexes. Uh, but before I finish, I would like to acknowledge uh, Di Wu, uh, who was working on this project and uh, did an excellent job implementing different data analysis approaches, and of course, a National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at NIH. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.